20% of voters, just over 18,400 people, cast their votes. There's a scene live now from the count, with the result expected shortly. Ten candidates are contesting the seat following the death of the veteran Labour MP Sir Ray Powell in December. He'd represented the constituency since 1979. Well, joining me in the studio is Anthony Howard, political commentator for The Times. Tony, thanks for joining us at this earlier. This ought to be a rock-solid Labour seat. Indeed, it has been Labour since its creation, I believe, in 1918. I think that's right. It's also only had two MPs in the last 50 years. I think Walter Padley, who was the president of the Shop Workers' Union, who sat for it till 1979, and uh, then Ray Powell, very old Welsh machine politician of formidable reputation, uh, who had it from um, 79 until he died. And given that record, are you expecting anything interesting to no. emerge? I think from there'll the be Lewis some relief. Time? There'll be some relief that the um, turnout is 35.3. You may remember there was a by election, was it in Leeds Central, Hillary Benn before the last election, and the turnout went down to under 20%. Um, now, the Welsh are better. I mean, they, they rather believe in voting, but it's not a ma magnificent thing to get 35, but it's better, I think, than some people had feared. Is that about average for a by-election? No, it's a, I mean, it's, nowadays it's... But Ipswich was more than that. Ipswich, which was the only other by-election we had in this parliament, I think that was sort of bordering 40. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not good, but considering how bad some turnouts have been, um, I think there'll be a measure of relief that it's not lower. In terms of the, the jostling for position, mm. though, that, that goes on, yep. come, come what may, in safe seats and marginal Quite. seats, uh, there has been some movement, hasn't there? I mean, at least when we look between the election in 1997 yeah. and the election last year. Yes, well, I mean, this seat didn't do at all well for Labour, really, in uh, 2001 that uh, Ray Powell's majority went down 10,000, and even more devastating, from a 72%, I think, or 71 point something percent turnout in uh, 1997, it went down to 58 or something. So it went down about um, almost 15% in turnout, and his majority tumbled by 10,000, with quite a big sw uh, swing to Plaid Cymru, the uh, Welsh nationalists. That may have been partly because Ray Powell was 72, and there had been some kind of argument about whether he should go on. There had even been a suggestion that uh, he might be given a peerage and someone might be parachuted in, as happened uh, elsewhere, in St Helens, for example. But uh, I think that perhaps the constituency was getting a little bit restless and thought perhaps he should have hung up his uh, boots. And so that may have had something to do with it. So, so you think it's more to do with local difficulties I than, think than, it than, is. than an advance by, a significant advance by Plaid Cymru? Yes, I think probably. I think it, it's a very old machine seat, uh, uh, you know, and I think that Ogmore, and that being the case, I think that people were getting a little bit impatient with that kind of politics. And of course, before this by-election, there was quite a row when Mark Seddon, who was the editor of Tribune and a member of uh, Labour's national executive, wasn't even put on the shortlist because in a by-election, the party nationally decides who the shortlist is that the selection conference is going to choose from. And that caused, I think, perhaps rather more bad feeling in London than it did in South Wales. But uh, it got it off to a bad start because it looked like, it really did look as if, you know, this was uh, real control freakery. Uh, well, Labour seems to have been working hard to it appeal, appeal hard. to its supporters. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Michael Foote went down there, I think, the night before last, was it Tuesday night, uh, with Mark Seddon. Because Michael Foote's a great supporter of Tribune. And uh, Michael Foote, at the age of 89, went down for a big meeting, which I think went very successfully. And uh, uh, Mark clearly, um, you know, behaved generously, saying, I'll bring Michael, drive him down. And of course, Michael Foote, coming from uh, Ebervale, where he was a member, is a big uh, name down there. And therefore, um, he's a member for Ebervale for, what, 27 years or more than that. Um, and I think they were, uh, that was quite a success. And they fought this by election. I mean, normally, it's a seat where you weigh the votes, you don't count them, you weigh them. Uh, but the Labour Party has fought it quite hard. I think partly because they were frightened of the applied. They thought there could be not an upset, but they could have a swing towards it. And um, they are the main rival. I mean, the, 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 I can say now, I think I'll be absolutely astonished if Plaid Cymru is in second. They were a long way behind the Labour candidate. And then there'll be a question of whether the Liberals or the uh, Conservatives come third. Last time it was very close. There were about 500 votes between them, I think, and obviously it will matter a lot to the Liberal Democrats uh, whether they uh, manage to keep 
what was their third place. But it's all a bit odd because politics in Wales and indeed, yes, indeed politics in Scotland is uh, different from the politics in England. Oh, absolutely. You, I was, yeah. was going to say, do you think on this occasion, or indeed in almost any Welsh election now, uh, that the events on the national scene that in Whitehall, that uh, what Tony Blair's up to and whether his his uh, his votes up or down is, is I significant. Don't think, I think they're more interested in the Welsh Assembly you know, in Cardiff that uh, it's what yeah. goes on there. And of course, interestingly there now, the uh, Labour Party is allied with the Liberal Democrats. They weren't at the beginning and Labour tried to go it alone, but they found they didn't have a majority that way. And so now they uh, are, as it were, co majority parties in Wales, so the Labour Party obviously is bigger. So uh, I, th I doubt if things like Joe Moore in hearing about this evening, of playing very big in Ogmore. I doubt it. All right, Tony Howe, for the moment, thank you. Well, we'll bring you more on the Ogmore count as soon as we have it, but not more first on reports of a major disturbance at an immigration detention centre in Bedfordshire. 65, the crackdown on suspect constituency of Ogmore, and there is the proof of it. The uh, tellers are up into the final stages of the count. We're expecting a result uh, in the next few minutes. 35.3% of voters, just over 18,400 people cast their votes. Ten candidates are contesting the seat following the death of the veteran Labour MP Sir Ray Powell in December. He had represented the constituency since 1979. Well, we apologise uh, that because of the count, we haven't been able to bring you World Business Report uh, this morning, but we can now bring you the weather with Nina Ridge. Thanks, Peter. It's going to be a frosty night tonight for many of us already. In some places, those temperatures were falling below freezing. Can they? Justin Webb, BBC News, The Hague. Counting is underway in the by-election in the South Wales constituency of Ogmore. 35.3% of voters, just over 18,400 people cast their votes. Ten candidates are contesting the seat following the death of the veteran Labour MP Sir Ray Powell in December. He'd represented the constituency since 1979. Well, stay with us for the declaration, which is expected in about five to ten minutes. But also stay with us for Anthony Howard, the political commentator for The Times, who's with us in the studio. Um, Tony, uh, how much of an electoral test is Ogmore? Well, I don't think the nation's on tenterhooks, I do have to say that. Um, it's not, really. We've had two by-elections so far in this parliament, as against four after the uh, previous election in 1997 at the same stage of the parliament. Neither of them, neither Ipswich, which took place in November, which uh, Labour held, nor this one, are in any sense a kind of gauge of national feeling, in my view. Uh, is there any significance? I mean, is anything likely to emerge? Well, I think what will emerge is a Labour victory, I should say that confidently. Um, and I think basically it's a contest between uh, Plaid Cymru and the Labour Party. And uh, it doesn't look to me on that poll as if there's going to be any sensational result. I think uh, the Plaid Cymru will come second. And then it will be a question of, well, there are ten candidates, but the next two places, I guess, will be taken by the Liberal Democrats and the Tories. And perhaps the only thing that matters is which of those comes third and which comes fourth. Liberal Democrats will be very distressed if they were to fall behind the Tories. Tony Howard, for the moment, thank you. And we can now welcome viewers to BBC One to our coverage of the uh, Ogmore by-election. And in doing so, we can cross live to our political correspondent, Gitto Harry, who's at the count. Gitto, bring us up to date. Well, you can see some counting uh, going on in the background. It's almost over. I think they're all huddling around. There's a certain se sense of excitement here because I think we will get the result in about 10 minutes' time. Nobody's really doubting what that result will be. I think it's safe to say that Labour will return an MP uh, from this constituency tonight, as they have done since 1918, without fail. The only difference tonight, perhaps, or in the last few weeks, is they've actually tried to fight uh, for that privilege, tried to fight for the support of uh, the people of Ogmore, rather than uh, cruised along on the back of uh, the general picture across the United Kingdom. And uh, the main question is, uh, who comes second? Plaid Cymru is safe in that position, I think. 
it's just a question of how strongly they do. Uh, some are predicting they might double their vote, but again, that would be a case of slipping back from where they're at. So the depressing for, um, situation, as some would see it, is that uh, Labour still has such a hold on valleys like this in South Wales that nobody can really challenge them. And because of that, it's a tough task for the new MPE to convince people uh, that he will make a difference, because in the end, this is not a marginal seat. And until it is a marginal, some local people, most of whom have not bothered to vote today, feel that it won't get the attention that it deserves. At one time, the electoral issue might have been the demise of the coal industry. Uh, now it's the demise of the steel industry. But is that really an issue? Well, what has had a resonance this week from the big picture across the UK, if you like, is the idea that Tony Blair, a Labour Prime Minister, is far more comfortable talking to, taking money from, and actually doing favours for very, very rich bill, uh, millionaires than he is coming down to places like Ogmore and seeing the poverty and the deprivation and the problems and the infrastructure failings uh, that uh, are very, very close to the hearts of people here. So what they have seized upon during the week is the contrast between uh, the willingness of the Prime Minister to try to help a rich businessman to secure a contract uh, overseas with what they perhaps see, whether rightly or wrongly, as his complacency uh, when there were British steel jobs uh, at risk in places not that far from this old mining town. So that certainly had a resonance. Plaid Cymru have fought this election as they have over the last uh, few years in places like this trying to offer the people what they used to get from Labour, trying to, if you like, be old Labour dressed in green, uh, attacking uh, new Labour. And the candidate here certainly looks the part. Some see him as a sort of uh, Peter Mandelson-like figure, but a lot less sinister. Uh, looking than some people find Peter Mandelson and that has been the main uh, resonance but I think the result tonight will reflect the fact that this seat is so solid for Labour that even with the best efforts of someone like Clyde Cymru all they can dream of doing is denting the large majority. All right, so thanks for that. We'll be back to you shortly. And indeed, we will bring you the result of the election as soon as it comes, probably in the next um, five minutes. The Queen Mother has arrived at Windsor ahead of Princess Margaret's funeral later today. She was flown there by helicopter and is said to be very hopeful of attending the service. Princess Margaret's coffin was taken from London to Windsor this evening. The start of the final journey. At a quarter past five, the princess's coffin, draped in her personal standard and adorned with white and pink roses, was driven from the Queen's Chapel at St. Palace. Three hours earlier, a helicopter had arrived at Sandringham to fly the Queen Mother to Windsor for her daughter's funeral. The decision to go by air instead of road was taken on the grounds that the 45-minute flight would be less of an ordeal. It took her straight to Royal Lodge, her home in Windsor Great Park. Since her last public engagement three months ago, the Queen Mother has lost much of her mobility. But in spite of her frailty and a slight fall yesterday in which she cut her arm, she's said to have coped well with the journey. Her determination was underlined today by Prince Charles in Dublin with the Irish President Mary McAleese. He was asked how his grandmother was feeling. As darkness fell tonight, the funeral cortege made its way slowly through the streets of Windsor towards the castle. A small crowd of onlookers stood watching in silence. I was very sad at the thought of Princess Margaret dying. I don't think she's had a terribly happy life. And um, yes, I was sad. As we happened to be close, close by, we thought we'd pay our last respects. Very sad. And so, as the coffin is driven into Windsor Castle, the scene is now set for tomorrow's funeral. That will be strictly private, for family and friends only. A quiet end to a life that was once full of glamour. Jenny Bond, BBC News, at Windsor Castle. A new row has broken out in Whitehall over Joe Moore, the advisor to Stephen Byers, who suggested using the September the 11th attacks to bury bad news. A spokesman for the Prime Minister said the Department of Transport was at war with itself after newspaper reports that Ms Moore had again suggested burying bad news, a claim denied by her and Downing Street. Joe Moore, a spin doctor for Stephen Byers' Transport Department, became an instant national hate figure last year when she sent a memo suggesting burying government bad news as New York's Twin Towers collapsed. I'd like to again sincerely apologise 
for the huge offence that I caused by sending the email. I can well understand the distress people will feel with what I wrote. I very much wish I hadn't written it. In fact, I find it difficult to believe that I did write it. An apology that saved her job, just, but some in the department didn't forgive her. Now, an anonymous civil servant has been leaking details of government emails implying that Joe Moore is at it again, wanting to get rid of more bad news tomorrow. The chief press officer, Martin Sixsmith, is reported protesting, Princess Margaret is being buried on that day. I will absolutely not allow anything else to be. And worse to come, number 10 was told the email was a fabrication and then accused of lying. A furious Downing Street now says there's a game going on in the transport department. Mr Sixsmith was being written to in the strongest possible terms about unacceptable and unprofessional leaks from his department. Old hands can't quite decide to laugh or cry. I think it's deeply dangerous, deeply demoralising. I mean, it's uh, an unseemly thing to have ferrets wrestling in a sack. To have them wrestling in a transparent sack under a floodlight, you know, is seriously damaging to a department. Transport. Tonight, a department at war with itself and in deep trouble with Downing Street. In the old days, Labour spin doctors were known for trying to bury bad news. Today, it seems they've moved on and are trying to bury each other. They may well succeed. It's very hard to see this ending without one and possibly more resignations or firings, and probably quite soon. Andrew Marr, BBC News, Downing Street. Now the headlines at a quarter past one. There's been a major disturbance and a number of fires at an asylum detention centre in Bedfordshire. Former Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic says the prosecution case is an ocean of lies. The Queen Mother flies to Windsor, determined to make Princess Margaret's funeral. And coming up later in the programme, we'll bring you the latest from the Ogmore by-election. President Bush has proposed a package of environmental measures as an alternative to the Kyoto Agreement on Greenhouse Gases, which he rejected last year. At a speech in Maryland, he set out a series of tax incentives to encourage businesses, farmers and individuals to reduce pollution. Environmentalists have criticised Mr Bush's initiative for not going far enough. As far as America is concerned, the Kyoto Agreement has gone up in smoke. And today the world... Stay from 7.30 on BBC One. BBC News 24. I'm Peter Coey. We are awaiting the result of the Ogmore by-election from uh, the Mystake Leisure Centre in South Wales. But first, uh, while we wait for that, a, a brief summary of the main news this hour. There's a major disturbance at an immigration detention centre in Bedfordshire. Dozens of police officers and more than 50 firefighters have been called to the Yarlswood Detention Centre in Clapham, Bedfordshire, to deal with a number of fires and destruction of property. Initial reports suggest a serious disturbance involving up to 400 people detained there. Residents living nearby have been told to lock their doors. BBC reporter Sally Chidsoy is at Yarlswood and says the disorder at the camp has been described as massive. Uh, the police helicopter is still hovering above the Arleswood Immigration Detention Centre this evening. It's been up there for a good long time now. There are several seats of fires burning and huge plumes of smoke are still coming over Yarlswood. All I can say is that I understand from a number of sources that uh, several hundred uh, um, people within the Yarls uh, camp, mostly East Europeans, were involved in what's been described as massive disorder. Uh, there was violence and damage inside and a number of fires were started and they are still burning fiercely tonight. Princess Margaret's coffin has arrived at Windsor from St James's Palace for her funeral today. The princess has broken with tradition by requesting a cremation after the service at St George's Chapel. The funeral will be attended by only the royal family and close friends. The Queen Mother's resting at Windsor before the funeral after arriving by helicopter yesterday. Her aides say she's recovered well from a fall at Sandringham on Wednesday. Doctors will decide whether she's well enough to attend the service, but she's said to be steely in her determination to be there. The former Yugoslav president, Slobodan Milosevic, has been putting his case to the war crimes tribunal in The Hague. He denies charges of genocide and crimes against humanity. He defended the actions of the army and police in Kosovo, saying they were fighting terrorism. Mr Milosevic produced graphic photographs of dismembered bodies, which he said were caused by the NATO bombing campaign. 
Transport Secretary Special Advisor Joe Moore has been criticised yet again. Speaking on the BBC's Question Time, the Chairman of the Commons Transport Committee, Gwyneth Dunwoody, questioned whether Joe Moore should stay in her job. Last year, she caused an outcry when she suggested September the 11th was a good day to bury bad news. She's reportedly considered the same tactic for Princess Margaret's funeral. Mrs Dunwoody dismissed this claim but said the advisor had shown appalling judgment. More energy-efficient homes could be built in Britain if a report looking into the future of the country's energy supply is approved. The review by the Prime Minister's think tank will also call for a 20% increase in renewable sources of electricity by the year 2020. But the report leaves open the question of whether nuclear power will have a place in future strategy. Palestinian militants have attacked a convoy of Israeli civilian vehicles and their army escort in the Gaza Strip. A bomb was detonated as the convoy drove along a road near Netzarim and three people are thought to have been killed in a gun battle that followed. The police officer who interviewed the key witness in the Damalola Taylor murder trial has denied manufacturing the girl's evidence. Defence lawyer Courtney Griffiths accused the officer of taking advantage of the 14-year-old girl because she needed an eyewitness. Sergeant Carolyn Crook strongly rejected the suggestion. Four teenage boys all deny any involvement in the killing of 10-year-old Damalola Taylor. The appeal by a Libyan man against his conviction for mass murder after the Lockerbie bombing has ended. Abdul Basid Ali Mohamed El Magrahi was jailed last year after being found guilty of planting the bomb in 1998 on a Frankfurt-bound flight at Malta Airport where he worked. The five judges, headed by the Lord Justice General, Lord Cullen, have now retired to consider their decision. It's likely to come in early March. Police have charged a man with the murder of estate agent Timothy Robinson. Mr Robinson was killed after parking his car outside his home in Battersea at the end of last month. A 17-year-old will appear before Richmond Magistrates Court tomorrow morning. Counting is underway in the by-election in the South Wales constituency of Ogmore. 35.3% of voters, just over 18,400 people, cast their votes. Ten candidates are contesting the seat following the death of the veteran Labour MP Sir Ray Powell in December. He'd represented the constituency since 1979. Well, we can cross now live to our political correspondent, Gitto Harry, who's at the count. Um, Gitto, I've been saying for about the last half an hour or so that the result was coming any minute. Um, is it any minute? Well, I've got to be honest with you, it's hard to tell at this stage. The officials who have been hanging around here have disappeared. There seems to be some kind of conference going on in the background. Nothing major, I don't think, but it has left the whole hall in limbo. You see various candidates and their supporters standing around, wondering what's going on, waiting for the result. There have been rumours of recounts uh, because of close results in some wards. It's not, uh, if that is the case, a recount in any way because that the ultimate result is in doubt but some parties here might be on the verge of keeping the deposit or losing it. So in financial uh, terms it makes a difference to them. There was some suggestion earlier on that perhaps the Conservatives were in that camp uh, though what I'm picking up on the ground suggests that they've done more or less as well as they did in the last general election. So some sort of sense of limbo but still uh, the overall feeling is that it won't be too long before we get the result and that result will be uh, a safe and convincing uh, Labour win on perhaps a slightly disappointing but not highly embarrassing turnout. So Tony Blair is likely to be cheerful over his breakfast in the morning? I think he'll be um, relieved that uh, his troops on the ground have again delivered a seat. Um, one Labour official I spoke to earlier tonight was actually going on about how the media always draw attention to the turnout. She says, well, at least we are winning all our seats. Uh, they're not losing seats uh, on the whole since they've come into power, whereas actually towards the end of the Conservative years, they were losing by-election after by-election, even in their strongest uh, strongholds. So in that sense, they're not that worried. But the, the worry that uh, is out there for Tony Blair and something that would be niggling away at him, his party chairman in particular, Charles Clark, is again this idea that they're failing to enthuse people, even in seats that have voted Labour as this one has since 1918. The low turnout, uh, the perhaps slight increase we're anticipating tonight uh, in the level of support for uh, what some would say hard left parties, certainly uh, socialist Labour, for instance, the Socialist Alliance, some are predicting a boost in their support and uh, largely the boost in Plaid Cymru support, which people are anticipating again, uh, a sign, some would say, uh, that there's disillusionment in Labour's heartlands with uh, the number of policies that the government is now pursuing, which they feel 
are at odds with their own base instincts and long-standing values. Okay, so for the moment, thank you. And we'll be back to Ogmore in just a few moments, I hope having said so so often in the last half hour. Millions of pounds of government money is to be spent to try to find the cause of autism, but the two and a half million pound fund won't be looking for any link between the disorder and the MMR jab. As the debate continues in the UK... BC News, Paris. Counting's underway in the by-election in the South Wales constituency of Ogmore. 35.3% of voters, just over 18,400 people, cast their votes. Ten candidates are contesting the seat following the death of the veteran Labour MP Sir Ray Powell in December. He represented the constituency since 1979. And we are joined again in the studio by Anthony Howard, commentator. Uh, Anthony, uh, are you expecting anything interesting to emerge from this election? Not terribly, I think. I don't think the fate of the government trembles on the brink or anything like that. No, I think it will be a safe Labour victory on a low poll, not disastrously low. I mean, it's better perhaps than they may have feared in Millbank. They may have thought it would be a repeat of that dreadful by-election that took place in, was it Leeds Central, Hillary Benn won before the last election, when the poll was 19.8% or something like that. This is uh, almost double that, so it's better than that. Um, it's not quite Sunderland, is it? If you remember how quick they got there, they only got 18,400 votes. I mean, to it's, it's, it's not a particularly, particularly large constituency. No, it's not. Geographically, I, I think is there it? may be. I think that uh, Gito may have been right in telling us that uh, there may be a hitch going on because it does matter nowadays. The deposit is 500 pounds, and uh, it's you've got to get five percent of the vote. Um, and if you are, say, the Tories might be in danger, or maybe one of the six other candidates thinks he can save his money. That is the only thing I can think of why there's been this delay. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's not, a, it's not a recount on who's won. I mean, I don't even think we can rule that out. It's not that kind of exciting recount. It's presumably if anyone is on the level of just about to get through the deposit can't, barrier. Can't they sort that out afterwards? Give us no, the results and then, and then no, recount. I think, you know, once it's declared, it's declared. And that has held things up in the past mm -hmm. in various places. But uh, I think it must be a hitch of that kind. Though I don't get the impression it's going to be an all-night wait. I mean, I think that we're probably within... Uh, it's, I know you've been saying it's imminent, Peter, but I think it now does look to me. People are clustering around again, I can see on the screen here, and I think probably we're within striking distance, at least I hope so. Um, it's tough on all the counters. I mean, they've they finished, I think they've finished counting. It's just a question of checking, presumably. Um, the original count is clearly over, and it's just sort of say, well, this is your tally, and then somebody may say, well, look, if I've only got 15 votes more, can't you check my vote anyway to see if um, I've saved my deposit? That's all I can think it may be. I was interested in what Guito said about maybe that uh, uh, steel business in Romania may not have played very well in the constituency because it does look as if somehow um, the Prime Minister or the government is keener on uh, looking after uh, a foreign national, which is what he is, and not looking after the steel works of South Wales. A, class is, a classic new Labour, yeah, old Labour tension. Quite. This has been, I mean, this has been, first of all, a mining constituency, and then it's very much on the brink of the steel area, and so it's really been clobbered twice over. Um, and that, of course, is part of the appeal of Plaid Cymru, that they say, look, we'll look after you. Um, if you feel abandoned, you know, give us the seats. You're not going to get it, in my view, but uh, if you did, we would fight for you more stronger than, uh, more strongly the new Labour. But they have been through a rough time. It's a close-knit community, small town, <laughs> uh, Pontypris, I think it's probably the biggest on the corners, uh, on the edge of it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it was, it was an old mining area and um, has been hard hit economically. Um, All right, Tony, Tony, we'll just leave it there for the moment, but no. we'll come back in just a moment. Well, Let's take a look at the headlines now at just after a quarter to two. There's been a major disturbance and a number of fires at an asylum detention centre in Bedfordshire. Former Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic says the prosecution case is an ocean of lies and the Queen Mother flies to Windsor determined to make Princess Margaret's funeral. The first ever purpose-built village for people living with the AIDS disease has opened in South Africa. The village, just to the west of Johannesburg, will house about 450 men, women and children. It's been built by a religious organisation which says it wants to give dignity to people who are terminally ill. A song of comfort and love for the children of South Africa who will die far too young.
The AIDS village has been built by Sparrow Ministries, a Christian organization, as a refuge for the terminally ill, not just children, but destitute adults as well. I think the difference is hope and caring, unconditional love. That, that's in my opinion, you know, that you're giving people back their dignity and you're trying to help them, you're showing them that as human beings we're not shunning you, we're assisting you. Milia Ungadi is one of those waiting to move into the AIDS village. Her own health is bad, but it's the plight of the children which hurts her most. Why these children? Why these children? I know everybody must die, but why the children? More than 100 HIV-positive children are born in this country every day. The AIDS village may offer comfort and dignity to a few, but it's no more than a drop in the ocean, such as the scale of suffering. Some South Africans are unhappy with the very idea of an AIDS village. They say it will isolate the sick and do nothing to remove the prejudice and stigma which surround this disease. But the organizers here say they're helping people who have been failed by society, who are already destitute and who in many cases have been turned away by government hospitals that simply cannot cope with this terrible epidemic. Barnaby Phillips, BBC News, Rudaport, South Africa. Well, as we've been telling you, counting is underway in the by-election in the South Wales constituency of Ogmore. 35.3% of voters, just over 18,400 people, cast their votes. Ten candidates are contesting the seat following the death of the veteran Labour MP Sir Ray Powell in December. He represented the constituency since 1979. Well, joining me in the studio, Anthony Howard, political commentator for The Times. Um, Tony, Labour have got an unblemished record on by-elections, haven't they? Yes, um, since they came in in uh, 1997, they haven't uh, lost a seat, I think I'm right in saying. Very different from the last days of the major government, where I think they couldn't even hold a seat from about the time that Hague won his by-election. And um, so there was a record, sort of, you know, nine pins going down all the time. Um, and, and, and that's often the case, though. It's often the case. It's happened to Hal Wilson. It's happened to Hal Wilson. He couldn't hold a seat at the end of the 1964 to 70 government. He kept losing by elections. No, Labour's done pretty well. They had one disappointment at the beginning after the 1997 election when there was a very marginal by election in Uxbridge, mm. which they might have hoped to win on the continuing swing, as it were, after their great victory. They didn't. They blew it by, uh, I think, having a row about the candidate and making the previous candidate stand down and put in some new Labour fellow. And it didn't work, but um, they ha they've done pretty well. I think we must be getting pretty near to it now. I see on the monitor that people are crowding around, but uh, this won't be. I mean, honestly, Labour holds Ogmore is not a big story. <laughs> it really isn't. I have to tell you that. Um, but uh, it, obviously, it will be a relief because in a situation like this, you know, you can't, as it were, do well. You could only be embarrassed, and therefore, anything that uh, I think we're just about to get the result. Uh, anything that uh, is safe is a relief. Well, I think our correspondent, uh, Gitto Harry, who's at the count, is listening in to us right now. Uh, Gitto, uh, the tension rising? Uh, yes, I think the picture tells you the story. The tables have been cleared away. Right. The returning officer is on stage. He's putting his glasses on. This is definitely Ladies imminent. Ladies and gentlemen, can I there please is blowing to the mic and I'll have your attention. You can I please ask the, the candidates to join officer. me? Here on the stage Ogmore. for the formal declaration, please. So the candidates going on to the stage in the sports hall here at the heart of this constituency. You see the colourful figure in the middle there with the balloon. All these by-elections, no matter how much of a foregone conclusion attract a colourful crowd as well as serious and credible candidates. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will read the declaration of result of poll, first in English and then in Welsh. Declaration of result of poll of the parliamentary election, Ogmore constituency. I, Yayan Kerry Lewis, being the acting returning officer at the election of a member to serve in Parliament for the Ogmore constituency held on the 14th of February 2002 do hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate at the election is as follows. Captain Beanie, 122. 
Gitto Ap Owen Beb, 1,377. Conservative. David Oswald Braid, known as Reverend David Braid, 100. <laughs> Leslie Douglas Edwards, 187. <laughs> Blethyn William Hancock, 3,827. Clyde Cymru. Christopher Herriot, 1,152. Socialist Labour. Jeffrey James Herford, 205. <laughs> Ivor Hugh Iranka Davis, 9,548. <laughs> and out come the placards. That result, not in doubt. Jonathan Howard Spink, 250. Veronica Kathleen Watkins, 1,608. <laughs> 34 ballot papers were rejected, and I do hereby declare that the said Ivor Hugh Iranka Davis is duly elected as a Member of Parliament for the said constituency. <laughs> So Labour has a new MP for Ogmore, a seat that's returned a Labour MP since 1918. Hugh Iranka Davis, a senior college lecturer from Swansea, the decoration will just about will now 20 be miles away. Now the MP for Ogmore. There you, there you have it as uh, we're hearing from Gitto and the returning officer, Hugh Aranka Davis, uh, replacing Sir Ray Powell as the constituency member uh, for Ogmore with uh, a little over 9,500 votes on a very reduced turnout, of course, in this by election. Uh, Tony Howard from the studio, what do you make of those figures? Well, they're not frightfully exciting. It's a very comfortable victory for Labour on a small poll. The um, Liberal Democrats have kept their, uh, their third place and Plaid Cumber. I think will be marginally disappointed. They replied Cymru got 3,000, I think, was it 327, um, which means, means that they got only a just over a third of the Labour vote. And I think in a by-election, they would have liked to have done better than that. Although the, it does compare well in terms of the In terms of their percentage, in terms of their percentage, they've certainly gone up. They've gone up from where they were at the last election. But I think in a by-election, they would have hoped to do marginally better than that. The most striking thing, in a way, is the vote for the uh, Socialist Alliance candidate. 1,152. That's a very respectable total. Well, this, into, into four figures for, for someone who's yeah, for a minority for, candidate for a party that, that yeah, wasn't yeah. even standing at the last election. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, and it's only what? It's only um, 200 votes or thereabouts behind um, mm. the Conservative, mm. um, who uh, only came in um, fourth with 1,377. So the Liberals have been relieved because they just kept their noses in front, not by all that much, but by about. Uh, um, 300 votes or so, <laughs> so they'll be happy that they weren't pushed in the fourth place. But I think the Labour Party really has cause for satisfaction. The Plaid Cymru trail of the poll has certainly gone up, but they've got a very comfortable victory, uh, almost to three to one over their nearest opponent. So no signs there for you in the numerical tea leaves of, of dissatisfaction well, amongst the... The Socialist, alliance, with, the, Socialist with, with the, the Socialist Alliance vote, I think, yeah. uh, is quite, you know, 1,152 doesn't sound very much, but it, on a small poll like that, it's weeks. quite a respectable total, and it's, as I say, it's uh, within 250 or so uh, of the Conservative candidates, so I think they'll be quite pleased. So, no, they are the people who fought up in St Helens and all that, did a slightly Don't better up friends. there against... Um, uh, Mr. Thank Woodward, I think they the did slightly better, but um, they, um, they, they won't be displeased with that. that so it's, it's quite, <coughs> it's probably, I haven't worked it out, it's probably just about to possibly uh, losing, I think, but it, it's, it's very near the margin. Um, 
I don't know anything about the people who've got 100 votes apiece. I mean, the various people who get in violations and come in with 100 and 157 and this kind of thing, I don't know what they were standing for, though one was clearly an entertainer who was wearing a balloon on his head. Uh, yes, apparently he's, he's stood rigidly in the, yeah. uh, in the Valley's constituencies. Uh, some success. Well, we used, we used to always have... He's made three mixed three we, I mean, we used to always have Screaming Lord Such, who now, alas, is dead, but he, he fought, goodness knows how many elections, remember that? And he once, actually, um, destroyed the remnants of the SDP by getting more votes than the Owenite SDP at the very end of the SDP's life, and that was what I think persuaded David Owen to throw the towel in. Being beaten by Screaming Lord Such and the monster loony raving party was not the kind of thing that you can easily live with. Anthony, thank you very much indeed for taking us through those figures. Anthony Howard, now it's time for the weather with Ninewich. Hello there. Yesterday we saw a top temperature of 10 degrees under some very welcome sunny skies. But those clear skies do mean that through tonight and in towards Friday morning, we're going to see a widespread frost developing. Temperatures in England and Wales possibly down to minus 2, minus 3 degrees but one or two spots just escaping the harshest of that frost where we see some clouds, some patchy rain drifting south on this weak front. And that will also lead to some rather cloudier skies to start off the day for a think around Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, through the Midlands, North Wales and up in towards Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland keeping the clouds for the afternoon, but elsewhere the clouds should break up. Once again we'll see some bright skies, the best of the sunshine along the south coast. A slightly different story for the northern and western Isles. Here, fronts giving some thicker cloud, one or two spots of rain. And here, temperatures around 7 degrees in towards the afternoon. Elsewhere, similar to yesterday, top temperature of 10 degrees. President Bush unveils his alternative strategy to combat global warming. The Enron whistleblower tells Congress who hid the truth about massive debts. Three Israelis die in ambush by Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip. Colin Powell meets the MTV generation and tells them Saddam Hussein should be toppled. Hello, this is BBC News. 